Now we have the next point on the agenda is three speakers. I suggest we invite each of the speakers to give a short presentation, but in order to save some time, we'll take questions for all three speakers at the end. Um, and I'm not quite sure whether all three speakers are here. I've met two of them, but, but Jason Kapuri from, from the NADA for President 2008. Is he here? Otherwise, I suggest we, we, we jump to Brent McMillan, who is the political director of the Green Party of the United States. He is here. Exactly. Mr. McMillan, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank Chairman Hastings for the invitation to address you this morning. 2006 was the second strongest midterm for independents and third parties in the United States since 1934. And Greens led the way. Uh, we ran a governor's race in Illinois. Uh, Rich Whitney, he had 11% with both major party candidates present in the race. Pat LaMarche, who ran for governor in Maine in 2006, got 10% of the vote with both major parties uh, present in the race. And this shows a, gr a growing dissatisfaction with the two major parties and their willingness to address the issues that we face. There are certainly unique challenges that we face as a minor party, and especially as the Green Party in the United States. Uh, one of those is that we uh, face pretty much a media whiteout. Our, our media is corporate controlled. Much of the message of the Green Party is counter to the corporate message. And so we fight a constant battle to get media access. That's especially true of our presidential and vice presidential candidates in this cycle. Former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney and Rosa Clemente, the first all women of color ticket in U.S. history. Uh, we ran an action in front of the Washington Post earlier this year in regards to the lack of uh, covering of Green Party candidates. Um, to kind of dispel a couple of myths about us, we've actually won more than 50% of our elections so far this year. We've gotten really good at winning uh, local level elections. And that's where we were particularly successful. Um, another thing that we face as a minor part of the United States is that we have a kind of a primitive form of democracy compared to Europe in that we have winner-take-all elections. And what that means is that, generally speaking, the most powerful interests get represented in, in uh, Congress and in our government. If you look at the Congress of the United States, it doesn't look like the American people. It's largely white, it's largely male, and it's largely millionaires. And so we're trying to change that to a more representative form of democracy. And one way we're doing that is by promoting election reforms like instant runoff voting and ranked choice voting. Uh, to give you a background on what instant runoff voting is, it's a single winner election in which voters have one vote and rank candidates in the order of preference. If no candidate receives a majority of first preference rankings, the candidate with the fewest number of votes is eliminated and the candidate's votes redistributed to the voters' next preferences among the remaining candidates. This process is repeated until one candidate has a majority of votes among candidates not eliminated. Currently, San Francisco is the largest municipality in the United States to use IRB or ranked choice voting. Here in this region, uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland, uh, in 2007, ran its first elections using IRV. And we see this as an interim step to a more representative form of democracy here in the U.S. We haven't upgraded our democracy in a long time. So often I refer to the U.S. democracy as, as we're, we're democracy 101. We really haven't moved to a more representative form. Another issue that we face is the issue of election integrity. And we're having a lot of problems in the U.S., uh, which comes as no secret, I think, to the rest of the world in regards to our election integrity. After the 2004 election, uh, the Nader campaign ran a recount in New Hampshire. The Greens and Libertarians ran a recount in Ohio. I talked with Teresa Motto, who was an aide to the Nader campaign, and we kind of compared notes to, the, to, to kind of class two types of election fraud that have become predominant in the U.S. One is what we call old school thuggishness, and the other are the new high tech forms of election fraud. Uh, old school forms, or uh, the, like kind of this old school thuggishness, which is still pretty rampant in the U.S., um, include things like deliberate voting, of, of, uh, deliberate shorting of voting machines, uh, includes voter intimidation of the polls, and includes purging voter rolls. 
uh, a lot of what we saw in both Ohio and Florida in 2004 and 2008. What we're also seeing now more is the high-tech forms of election fraud. And I want to give you one example of that. And that's a company called Vote Here, which is a division of Daytegrity, which pr uh, prints a unique barcode in every ballot and pre-links it to your name before you receive the ballot, just like Zimbabwe, opening the door to voter intimidation. Recognizing that this uh, was a violation of the secret ballot, Greens in San Juan County in Washington State filed a lawsuit against this product. In the process, they learned that Robert Gates, then former director of the CIA, served on the technical advisory board to developing the product. There are several re retired CIA operatives and officials in the San Juan Island chain in Washington State, including Orcas Island, where now current Secretary of Defense Robert Gates maintains one of his homes, San Juan County. Uh, was the first jurisdiction to deploy this product. And so we're working to stop this from advancing onto Washington State and eventually onto the United States. But it's just one example of the battles that we fight for election integrity here in the United States. We also face some onerous uh, ballot access laws. And here in the U.S., if you're running, uh, you've got 51 different sets of election laws to deal with, including the District of Columbia. And then there's a class system, so it's easier for major party candidates to get to the ballot access than it is for minor party candidates or independents. So we spend a lot more time and energy on getting ballot access than what they do, which means there's less time to actually run for office. Uh, following the 2004 election cycle, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania decided to hold candidates personally, financially accountable for the cost of ballot access challenge if, if they fail to prevail. This has a bone-chilling effect on independent and third-party candidates from running for office. For example, the Green Party candidate for governor in 2006, Mara K. Rogers, was financially intimidated from running for office. Carl Romanelli, the Green Party candidate for U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania in 2006, decided to stay the course and weather the Democrats' attempt at financial intimidation. He's now being asked to pay a large sum of money to Democrats for having failed to overcome their challenge. What we now know is that Democrats use paid operatives to carry out the, these challenges, so there'll be further lawsuits over time. What happened in Pennsylvania is now considered a human rights violation by the Helsinki court. Uh, earlier this year, Mother Jones senior Washington correspondent, James Widgway, broke a story about how a green group had been targeted for black ops by former Secret Service agents and cops. Um, uh, former Secret Service agents had formed a security firm called Beckett Brown International. Uh, since then, two moles have been outed. One worked for uh, the Maryland State Police Department and was involved with infiltrating anti-war groups and anti-death penalty groups in the Tacoma Park and Silver Springs area. The other mole that we outed was working on behalf of the National Rifle Association up in the Philadelphia area to infiltrate uh, gun control groups. Uh, I've been uh, staying in touch with the investigators that are working on this, and what they, one thing they've told me that they found out is how much of this kind of work is being funded by Exxon in order to control U.S. energy policy. And they assure me there will be a lot more moles outed as this investigation continues. So um, coming out of the 2006 election, the American people expressed basically three major issues that they're concerned about. One is the war in Iraq. They want us out of there. They want the troops home. Two is global warming and the, and the lack of action on the part of this federal government in regards to global warming. And three is health care. It's an absolute embarrassment that a country this wealthy does such a poor job of taking care of its people. Well, those, those issues look like a Green Party platform. And um, one, of the, one of the things that we work really hard to do is to stop wars of imperialism. We see the slide of the American government into uh, becoming an empire. And we see the war in Iraq as an example of that slide into empire. Uh, we're also working to stop the invasion of Iran. Um, I had a chance to speak with Donald Wheaton Jr., who was Ronald Reagan's advisor in Iran, two weeks before the national intelligence estimate came out. And he said that one thing it's going to show is that the claims that the Iranians have been working on nuclear weapons program is a lot like the, the uh,